us bow. Father God, we come now in the master's name of Jesus. First of all, Lord, we want to thank you for who you are and what you are. I want to thank you, O oh God, that you allowed our days to roll on a little bit longer. For you woke us up this morning in due time. You gave us activities of our limbs. And you gave us a mindset to come out to the house of worship. Amen. Father God, you told us in Joshua 24 that if we would assemble ourselves around this side of the mountain. And if we would set our minds and our hearts on worshiping you, that you would be in the midst. And in the midst, you said there's a unilateral covenant that goes along with that, that you would supply all of our needs. If we would just be willing to hear your word and be governed by your word and do your word, you said the unilateral covenant <coughs> is activated in our lives. Father God, we just thank you for bringing us together one more time. Father God, we ask you now in the name of Jesus to bless your man today, Lord. Because all of the things that go on around us, Father God, sometimes causes us pain. But Lord, we know that you are a healer and you are a doctor who's never lost a patient, Father God. And we ask that you would bless us. Let your spirit and your anointing fall in this house. That when we leave this place, we know that we have been in your presence, God. We thank you for uh, mag 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 magnifying and mag uh, 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 allowing us to know that you are with us on today. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I want to call your attention to the word of God. It is found. Okay. It is found in Romans. It is in Romans, the 13th chapter. And it is the entire 13th chapter. Amen. When you get that, please rise to your feet in reverence of reading the word of our God. For this 
Thou shalt not commit adultery, shall not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandments, it is uh, briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Amen. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day uh, not in riding and drunkenness and in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. Here it is right here. This is what I'm after. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not, uh, amen, provisions of the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, the hearers, and the doers of his Word. Amen? Amen? Amen. Listen, I want to continue in that series that we've been talking about, about transformation. Uh, today I want to talk about living like Jesus. Amen. I want to talk about living like Jesus. Amen. Living like Jesus. Living like my Lord and Savior. Amen. It's interesting, my brothers and sisters, as we look at the idea, amen, of standing and as we look at the idea of doing things for God, we sometimes are put in a position where we have to, as we say, put on our big boy pants and take a stand. Amen. If you've ever heard somebody make that statement, it sometimes seems a little bit out of whack or out of sequence, but when someone makes such a statement, amen, it causes me sometimes to buck up or it causes me to think about what they're talking about. There it is. Amen. Put on uh, my stand. There are times when we have to suck it up and move on. We have to suck it up and do what we are supposed to do. There are times of fear, you know, when you have to put on your big boy pants and go on and face that giant. Come on, some of us have been in the military and we've been out in the brush and even though, come on Brother James, even though there was a lot of nights you were scared as bullets flew over your head but you had to come to a, a, an agreement within your own self and say, look here, I'm going to put on my, my, my big smile today. I'm going to pull out the big guns or put on my big boy pants because if I don't and take a stand, they're going to take over me. Hell, that a witness time of war sometimes when somebody breaking your car or steal something from you, and I'm bad with that one because I struggle a lot of times uh, because I, it's something about somebody taking something from me that just bothers me to no end. But sometimes somebody will break in your car and you don't even know who it is, you don't know how to find out who it is, you just have to suck it up and move on, amen? Your stand is, is that I resolve that I don't care what happens, I'm going to make sure that this never happens to me again. Times of failure are times when we have to put on a stand. You know when you try to do things the best that you can and you did this and did that, you finally have to recognize within yourself, guess what? I may get it, but it won't be the day. I, 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 may, I may conquer this, but it won't be the day. You have to take the stand and look here. I've done all that I can do today. It's now time to let it go. I used to say, sometimes when you go hunt, you get the rabbit, and sometimes the rabbit gets you. Amen. Uh -huh. Times of hurt, 
causes us sometimes to take a stand, amen, and move on. When somebody passes in your life or when something happens that hurts your heart, sometimes you just got to suck it up and move on. She's gone, honey. She, he, she's gone. She's not coming back. He's gone. He's not coming back. It's over now. And it's time to pick up the pieces and move on. Amen. But you know what? That, that, there are times like that where you have to do that. You heard people make the statement, you got to put on your big boy pants or you have to sit up and get up. Amen. You heard the thing to put on your game face. Come on, brothers. We've had a lot of time to put on our game face and go on and face the game. Amen. Sometimes I, I heard women, a woman said the other day, tie your hair up and square up. I said, look, sound to me like they trying to fight one another. But what she trying to say is, look, I'm getting ready to take a stand. Whether it's right or wrong, guess what? It's time for me to take a stand. Amen. They're all designed to put you and to quicken you into a higher state, amen, of mind for the task that is at hand. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? There's a task at hand and sometimes you've got to be quickened to move from where you are to where you should be. Why? Because time is of the essence. Why? Why are you sitting here contemplating? Why are you sitting here with your lip out? Why are you sitting here trying to wonder what you're going to do? Guess what? People are dying out there and going to hell and it's your responsibility to try to reach it. Amen. Are, you, are you hearing me? Amen. It's your responsibility. Let me move on because I really can stay there for a little while longer. But let me see if I can give you some background here of what was going on. Uh, we've been talking about transformation, amen, instead of confirmation. Why? Because we need to be transformed uh, by the renewing of our minds with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because God has need for us in what we do. He didn't just say you and I just because we were good or because we looked good or our continence was good. He didn't save you because you had a good voice or because you could do this or that. He saved you with a purpose in mind. Amen. He saved you so that you can go out and tell people like you what God can do for them, what God can do for somebody who came just like you. It says, look here, look here, one of us, amen, ought to be able to go back and get somebody else. Why? Because we recognize that God did it for us. So we've been dealing with the idea of transforming ourselves and we have stopped at the idea of Christian love. Amen. Christian love, uh, when, God, when, when Paul started talking about Christian love, he said, look here, this is a whole new code. This is a whole new thing we're doing here. I know everybody's familiar, or at least some people are familiar with the, with the Ten Commandments. He said, look, well, that, that's good stuff right there, but, but, but that's a new whole code that goes with this grace and mercy idea, and you've got to know what that code is and how to live as you're supposed to live. I told you, a uh, uh, Paul did, did a very lot, logical thing all the way up to verse 12. And after verse 12, he begins to give you the practical on how you need to do things in the body of Christ. Amen. He gives you, you, you can read all day long what the Bible says, but I told you this before, if you don't know how to apply it to your life, it's just words. Amen. It's just stuff that we read and say that things are good. But, but he decides, look here, I, I need to give you a new code. Starts out, start this out with a new code or a new commandment, and that commandment was love. Matthew 22 and 36 says, Master, uh, which is the greatest commandment in the law. 37 says, Jesus says unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, and with all of thy mind. He said, This is the first and the greatest commandment. Now, just in case there was somebody back in the background who knew there was 10 before. They probably was thinking to themselves, well, what is the second? So he went on to answer that without them saying a word. But he said, uh, this is the way he says, and the second one, it's like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor just as they would love thyself. Amen. And on these two, you can hang all the laws. You can hang all the prophets. You can hang all of the advantage, you can hang all of uh, the prophecy, you can hang all of the theology, and you can hang them all on two things, and that is to love the Lord that God and to love thy neighbor. As I said, think about a world where everybody loved one another, and there was no envy and strife and jealousy and meanness in the world, and you were so concerned about your neighbor just far as you are yourself. But now there's an issue in this, in this that I see already, and that is a lot of people really don't love themselves. Right. It's hard for you to love somebody like you love yourself, because you know, you know, I, uh, one of the things. So 
Sometimes, you know, uh, uh, I would come home after work, and instead of going on to get my shower and getting clean, I go out on the street and I'm out, you know, in people's face, and I'm going to visit sick folks. And I thought to myself, now, is that really what I would want somebody to do? To come into my hospital room smelling like oil and with my hands and fingernails dirty? I said, that, that's not doing, you know, I wouldn't want you to come in and do me like that. Think about what I'm saying. I wouldn't want you to do me like that, so why would I treat you? Like that. Amen. Amen. So he said, look here. The problem with that is a lot of us really don't know how to love ourselves. We don't know how to really take care of ourselves. We don't know how to hug ourselves. We don't know how to tell ourselves that we love it ourselves. We don't know how to look in the mirror and find something good to say about that there yourself. I know when I was when I was in college, every time I would go past the mirror on my way out to class, I'd look in the mirror and go, showtime. And that meant that I was ready to do what I needed to do for that day. Amen. We don't know how to have showtime with ourselves. Amen. We don't even know how to spend time with ourselves and be satisfied. There's a problem in this thing about loving thy neighbor because a lot of us have issues with ourselves. We still got the monkey on our back from what we used to be and what we used to do. We still kicking ourselves over things that we didn't do and things that we didn't say. But God said, look here, when I made you free, I made you free. In the John 13 and 34 says a new commandment, amen, I give unto you that ye love ye one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. 35 says by this all men will know who you are, amen. amen. By this all men will know whose side you're on. By this all men will identify you with who your maker is, amen. amen. The idea of filia, it is the most general form of love in the Bible because it encompasses for fellow humans, for care, for respect, and compassion for people that in need. It is called brotherly love. Amen. We should have it for our fellow humans. We should have it for one another. We should have it for our enemies. Remember last week? I told you it's easy uh, to love somebody who loves you, but it's it, but, but if you really want the reward of God, try loving somebody, amen, that's kicking you all the way. Come on, I ain't the only one with kids, amen, and some of our kids, amen, you can try to love them all you want, and they just as contrary as they want to be. Guess what? If you can love them, you ought to be able to love somebody in the street like that, amen? amen. It says here that we should have a, a love for our fellow men. Romans 12 and 10 says, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honoring and preferring one another. My brothers and sisters, you must have no boundaries or walls when it comes to love. Amen. Amen. I hope you got that. Let me say it again. You must have no boundaries. In other words, there is nothing that you won't do for somebody else. Amen. Because you expect God to do all this stuff for you. But you're not willing Amen. to help somebody else. Amen. On, you, you got all this stuff. God has blessed you uh, with a good job. I'm talking about myself now. God has blessed you with some good friends. God has blessed you with good help up until tomorrow. God has continued to keep you and you still can't do nothing for nobody else. I told you guys while I was in North Carolina uh, we ran up on a guy who was standing on the side of the road, and because I was out of town, you know, well, I don't like to give money like that anyway, but I had a friend of mine with me who wanted to give all the money that she had in her purse, and I had a bad problem with that, but here's what I began to understand, and that is, is that because you have love and compassion for your brother, you got to can't help it. You can't help but seeing somebody down without trying to lift them up. That's why I can't understand folk who will walk past somebody who's going through something, and you at least can't even give them a good word. Amen. You at least can't say anything. But listen, when you can't do nothing for somebody, the best thing you can do is pray for them. Amen. But how many people pray for those guys or people you know are less fortunate? Amen. And you, are, you got to have no walls. Amen. It, just, it transcends who you are and everything that you've done. When you love without boundaries or walls, amen, it doesn't matter what you've done, amen. You just got to help because you got to have it. It loves uh, 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 regardless of your income. It loves regardless of your stature. It loves regardless of your age. It loves regardless of your feelings. And a lot of problem that we have when it comes to love is our own personal feelings. It's our own feeling. I don't care, you know, whether I like the person or not. If God tell me to do something.
something for them, I got to do what God tells me to do. But sometimes we don't let our own personal feelings get in the way of God. And you lose your blessing while you out there trying to be smart and be better than God. That's how you lose a whole lot of stuff. If God tells you to do something, you got to do it whether you agree with it or not. We see people, you say, I ain't gonna get them no money, they just go buy some liquor with it. I'm gonna buy them no money, they just go buy some crack with it. But you remember when you was in that condition. Amen. And people still blessed you anyway. Amen. Amen. Knew what you was gonna do with it, but they blessed you anyway. The song says, What is this uh, that I'm feeling so deep inside? What is this? Uh, that whatever it is, it won't let me hold my peace. This, the, the theme of the this is the love of God. Amen. The this that they're talking about is when God invades or transforms your heart. Why do I know that? Because it says, look here, it'll make you love your enemies. It'll make you love your friends. Amen. It'll make you love when you don't even want to do something for somebody else. Amen. It should make you, but the issue is the church is full of unloving. Now the issue I got with this is that the church is full of folks who talk about love, have no idea what it is. Uh -huh. Full of people who always got a praise on their lips, but if it come down to giving you a ride, they'll pass you by. Amen. All yeah. right. They got new suit, nice suits and nice cars, but it comes down to they really don't have the type of love that they should have. What's the song? Say, deep down in my heart, I got the love of Jesus. Where's that? Down deep in my heart. The church has a bunch of unloving folk in it. Amen. That's why you seem to have a whole lot of issues. Amen. With that hospital, it's because we got people who talk a good game, but they really have no love. They talk about it, and they sing about it. And if you are conforming and no, and no transforming, then everything that you do is a fake. Amen. If all you're doing is in there saying hallelujah and praising God with no love, guess what? It's all a fake. Amen. And so you got to learn how to love people in spite of how you feel about their situation. I'm getting ready to move from there because our text, uh, amen, talks about how to live like Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text tells us uh, uh, how we ought to love. Romans 13, uh, 1 through 7, Paul consistently teaches that the believer must submit to establish authority in the context of the household and the government since these institutions are ordained by God. Let me tell you, you know, you know even though we don't, may not like, uh, what's his name, uh, Trump 45, guess what? He wouldn't have got in there if God didn't say he'd get in. I don't care about the trickery and everything that went on and how it went on. Guess what? Trump was ordained to be the president before the foundation of the world was designed. I agree sometimes we get our mind so mixed up and so messed up on some of the stuff that go on. But baby, I need to tell you that our king is still on the throne. Amen. Our king still reigns supreme and our king is still in charge of this world. Yes, there's a prince who's running rapid, but guess what? He can't do nothing unless he considers the king. So when you talk about leaders and stuff like that, anybody that is over you, you need to be respectful to that situation. Don't go on your job late and talk about they better not say nothing to me today. Don't go on your job with an attitude. And I'm going to tell you why you need to respect leaders because when you talk about being for Christ, people are going to start watching you. You see that singing all the more crazy church songs about following Jesus and acting right and living right and he's changed my heart. People began to watch you. Because they want to know if what you say is what you live. Amen. Are you hearing me? Amen. And some of us, it's the only light they're going to get. So when you go on the job and you cussing out the boss, you're not showing the love of God. When you in there with a nasty attitude and face all contorted and they can't say nothing to you, they can't speak to you, guess what? You're showing them the love and the light that you claim to have, amen? And so when you in there talking all that Christian stuff, a lot of people don't even respect you. Because I'm going to tell you what happened. People who don't even speak to you, when something happens in their life and they need somebody to talk to God, they'll come find you. I spoke all the time, coming up to me, asking me to pray for them and pray for their honor and pray for their daddy and pray for their son. Why? Because, listen, if you can't see no light in me at the job, then guess what? 
There's something wrong with my life. Amen? There's something wrong with my life. Matthew 22 and 15, uh, Jesus teaches about respecting authority. He ends uh, after looking at the penny or the pence. He says, render unto Caesar what is his and unto God what is his. In other words, he's respecting the authority that Caesar is, the modern day ruler in that town. Amen. Verse 1 of our text says, it says, let every soul be subjected unto the higher powers, for there is no power but God. The powers that be are ordained by God. In other words, my brothers and sisters, there is a code of conduct of how you should act and how you should represent God to this world. There's a code of conduct of how we should conduct ourselves, not only in church, but when we are out of church. And if you don't miss somebody, and they're, they're one way in church, and they're just as holy and sanctified, and you catch them out there, and they're totally different, their language is different. They got a whole lot of profanity in their mouth, and they got a whole lot of craziness going on in their life. And you say, look, I just saw so-and-so. Or, I'm going to tell you, I used to play in a jazz club, and I also used to play in a church, a double dip. And, and what would happen, some of the same people that would be in the club, I would see them on Sunday morning. Amen. Now, they're in there. You may not in there to preach to me. Amen. Because I don't even know what I am. But they're professing Christ. But they're in there acting the way they're acting. Amen. It does something for your witness when people don't see a whole lot of light coming out of you. Amen. Uh, uh, you should always reflect the light that is within you, the light of God that he's placing you in. This does not mean uh, to be blind, obedient, because uh, to nobody but God. In other words, don't be blindly walking in and doing what everybody say. A lot of times, the Bible depicts the government as up there, uh, as uh, the, the, the disciples and people standing up against the government. But when you're right, you're right. But they always did it with a dignity of, of recognizing God and always being Christian or loving about how they went about doing what they needed to do. And amen. Daniel 4 and 17 says the Old Testament consistently views God as the ultimate authority over human government. Amen. So I don't care who it is that is in power and who it is that is doing whatever they're doing. They might think they're in control, but guess what? He's still in charge of this world. He's still the one, amen, that spun of the earth. He's still the one that put it in his sock. He's still the one that put the stars in the sky. He's the one who causes the sun yeah, yeah, to yeah, rise yeah, in the morning yeah, and go down at night. He's yeah, the one yeah, yeah. who tells the rain when it's time to drop some drop. He's the right. one who tells the wind, okay, it's time for you to go to the east and west. God is still in control yeah. of this world. Don't get it confused. My brothers and sisters, I know the news plays a crazy trick on us, but guess what? I don't care how bad the criminal is. I don't care how many people he shot. Guess what? God is still in control. Amen. 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 Uh, uh, verse 2 in this, and I'm almost out the way. Verse 2, Paul says that resisting that authority is the same as rejecting the authority of God. Let me say that one more time. He says that when you reject or resist the authority that the, of somebody who is over you is just like resisting the authority of God. Sometimes God puts you in some situations, amen, just to teach you how to be obedient, amen. He puts you in some places where you have to learn how to be obedient. How is God going to tell you to do something and you got your own mind and idea for how you want it done? Sometimes he want it done crazy. He Sometimes he want it done emphatical. Sometimes he just want it done a different way. We can't always do it our way and expect for our way to match up to God's way. Every now and then you've got to know what God expects you to do and how God expects you to do it. Why? Because this is his program. Yeah, 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 yeah. His program and not ours. I know sometimes we get a little bit ahead, but look here, this is his program. It says here in, from verses 8 through 14, and I'm kind of scamming through Paul terms, his, his, his uh, discussion around now. He's been talking about the government. He's been talking about rulers, but now Paul begins to turn his attention, amen, and addresses the relationships that we have with one another. Give me about 10 more minutes and I'll close this day. He talks about the relationships that we have with one another, the primary uh, ethics that should govern all Christian relationships ought to be love. Let me, let me, let me make sure we understand that. The, the basis for every relationship we have, good, bad, evil, whatever, it ought to be based in love. Amen. It ought to be based in the love that God showed you. And if you don't have that type of love, if you don't have a good relationship, a good Christian relationship, Paul cites the Old Testament law to show how acting in love fulfills the true intent of the law. If you look at the law, all he's trying to get you to do is be loving toward everybody and everything. 
you to be aware and to be awakened, amen, by the fact that you've got to love like Christ loved in this world. Have I got a witness? Paul uh, goes on to say, knowing uh, the time that now is a high time to awake light of your sleep, uh, for now is our salvation near than we would ever believe it to be. I was watching a program this morning uh, that Herbert W. Armstrong started probably about 50, 60 years ago, and this guy is still on there talking about being closer to the end time, amen, being closer than we ever was, being closer to us leaving and God fulfilling his promise to take us out of here, amen, and, and, and that knowing the time is now high time, like I said, you got to wake out of your sleep, but now is our salvation nearer than when we first started to believe. The night is far spent, is what the word says. The day is at hand. It says, let us therefore cast out the works of the darkness, amen, and let us put on the armor of God. Now let me get one more point in, and then I'm going to sit down, because we remember God told us to put you on the whole armor of God, why? That we were able, amen, to withstand the stuff that the evil one was going through. He talks about a helmet. He talks about a shield. He talks about our feet being charged with the preparation of the gospel. He talks about all of the armor that he wants us to put on just so we can withstand what the devil is trying to do to us. Here, he's talking about putting on something before you put on the armor. Amen. He's talking about, look here, you've got to girl, or you've got to surround, or you've got to wrap yourself in and out with the spirit of God. Why do I say it? the spirit of God? Because God is love. Have I got a witness? He, God is love. And if God is love, then that means Jesus is also love. Amen. So you've got to wrap yourself or clothe yourself in Jesus Christ. Why? you got to clothe yourself in Jesus Christ. He said, look here, guys, you got to understand, I'm not going to always be with you. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to always be outside of you. He said, but look, there's somebody coming who's going to come from the inside out. In other words, once he goes into you, he becomes the light that I was to you. Amen. He becomes the lamp on your pathway that I was to you. Amen. He becomes that which is supposed to teach you and keep you as you go. I'm going to close right above now. Amen. So he says here, let us walk honestly as in the day. Not in riding and in drunkenness. Not in chambering. Not in one time. Not in strife. And not in it. What he's telling us is that we've got to walk like Jesus walked. Amen. And we've got to talk like Jesus talked. If you want to know how to live a Christian life, you've got to live like Jesus lived. For Jesus, not only is love, but Jesus is the light of the world. So he says, look here, you need to curb yourself in the love of God, and that love is Jesus Christ. For God so loved us so much so that he wrapped himself in bodily form and came down into a manger to, to provide restitution to himself for the penalty payment of sin. I talked about the atonement before, and when God, when Jesus came, do you remember they, that he was wounded for our transgression? Yeah. He was bruised for our iniquity, and the chastisement of his peace was upon us. And I heard Andre Crouch say, and with these stripes, guess what? I am healed. When they took him from judgment hall to judgment hall, they didn't recognize that Jesus was the love of the world. But God said in, in 3 and 16 that he so loved the world. In other words, God said that I, I gave you Jesus to the world. Amen. That whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So in other words, he gave us Jesus as the restitution for our sins. And they took him and put nails in his hands and they put nails in his feet and they pierced him in the side. He was loving us. He didn't know, we didn't know what God was doing because it says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us on an old rugged cross. But that's not how the story is. They said early uh, one Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands. And when he got up with all power in his hands, he also got up with the power to make me over again. He so much love that he found me in the place that I was at and 
I didn't have to move. I didn't have to get up. He saved me right where I was at. He transformed me, amen, by his word and his spirit, amen. I thought my life was over. I thought everything was done. I thought I could get no better, but Jesus came that I might get better. He says, burn yourself, amen, with Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ, the love of God is so wonderful, amen. The love of God is so wonderful. The love of God, amen, is so powerful, amen. The love of God is so gripping, amen, that it gripped you where you were. You were on shaky ground and he established you on some new ground. The love of God will keep you in the midst of trouble, amen. The love of God will restore you when you think nobody else can. The love of God will heal you when you think the doctor has given up on you. The love of God will take your children, amen, and keep them safe while they leave the house and bring them home. Say the love of God will give you a job and an income. The love of God, the love of God will stabilize your mind because he said I'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. The love yes, of God is the, it's so great. The love of God keeps us when you're falling. Gird yourself with the love of God. And you can live the way God wants you to live. Amen. Jesus is the light that shineth in me. That shineth in me. If I walk the way he wants me to walk, he'll show up in me. And that's what you want. The world to see Jesus in you. When you're transformed, you can walk into a room 